where she explores um, the space of complex problems. Do you know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about invasive species and pests. And she does this in two ways. Firstly, it's um, focused on her exhibition at Mona. Secondly, it's part of her work called Eat the Problem, which is a book that she's recently released. And it's where she puts these species on the menu. And this is what you're going to hear about tonight. Her work, Eat the Problem. It's part of Kirsha Kashala's lifelong work. So it kind of imagine sitting down to a dinner of... Uh, cane toed legs. Can you imagine that? What about feral cats? Does that, how does that make you feel? Oh. Well, Kisha is going to take you on this journey and uh, explain this a little bit further, but you're going to find out how all of these things can be turned into absolutely delicious meals. Um, among her many talents, uh, Kisha is also the woman behind the 24 Carat Project, which basically creates kitchen gardens in disadvantaged areas. She's also the woman behind Heavy Metal, which is a project focused on uh, mercury contamination in the Derwent River and Trashism. And I hope I've pronounced that right, Kersha. Um, it's Mona's zero waste initiative create, um, and basically creates feasts as living art installations among a whole list of of other things. Now, please make her welcome for her talk tonight, Kisha Kashala. <clears throat> Hello. Turn this baby on. Can you hear me at the back? Is that the right amount? OK, great. Seeing as how I've spent the last five years slaving over Eat the Problem, my book about transforming invasive species into food and art, I'm completely disinterested in the subject, <laughs> except the cocktails. <laughs> my new fascination is designing a citywide reusable food container system for all the takeaway and delivery, using intelligent design to transcend waste generation. Woohoo! Trashism! Trashism! The next book. But <laughs> I agreed to talk about invasive species here, and I really want to sell that book. <laughs> Oh, that's on. The green is on. That book. I really want to sell that book. I really want to sell my book. <laughs> and most importantly, I want to sell more copies than David, my husband, has sold of his book. Um, allow me to give you a close-up. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Here's a <the> close-up. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> that's me stepping on something. Okay. I hope you have yourself one of these. They are very nice. It's an invasive feral boar's eye ice sphere cocktail. I think it's called like stare black margarita. So, you know, as you enjoy the cocktail quickly so that the ice sphere doesn't melt, if it melts, you get the feral boar's eye in your cocktail. As you enjoy it, it stares back at you and scrutinizes your choices. <laughs> um, I'm actually making mezcal out of invasive species, out of invasive agave on the mainland. And sugar cane is another invasive weed <clears throat> in many places. So you can make invasive rum. In this book, there's lantana gin. Lantan is known to be a kind of horrible, well, pretty and poisonous weed, but in a gin, it's perfect. Um, absinthe, and if that's not enough for your drinking pleasure, we're currently working on a thistle, we are working on a thistle digestif to deal with the massive thistle problem we have on our property in Marion Bay. <clears throat> so that'll be a good party. All of those volunteers for the coastal care, 
When you come out, you're gonna, we're going to finish with a party. <laughs> Turn that thistle into something good. Um, Eat the Problem has been rather successful in the media. And I think that's because people are just fascinated with the idea of eating cats. <laughs> I seem to have tapped into some dark fascination. And yes, there are a couple of recipes for feral cat in the book. Every pat, pet, come nightfall, turns into a little beast eating all those bilbies and all those birds. As the pest controller interviewed for the cat chapter by Emily, <laughs> thank you, Emily, <laughs> um, says, there's a reason cats are called roof rabbits. I'll let you ponder that for a moment. But basically, rabbits are known to be delicious, if that helps. <clears throat> There's a cat tamale recipe, and a cat fur poncho, <laughs> and a couple of interviews with some amazing cat hunters. Oh, that last guy, he sent us a whole box of cat fur cozies, so should you, for your beer, you know, to keep it cold. So should you feel the need, you can come pick one up at the gift shop. And this man is an aboriginal hunter who kills the cats because he's so passionate about the loss of the birds and the bilbies in his native land. And he describes in the most fascinating way how to track a cat, which takes several days. I'm an artist, so everything I create has to be art, <clears throat> including this dinner table, which also happens to be a glockenspiel, the world's largest glockenspiel. If you want to know about science, we had to work with a NASA plate physicist to figure out how to cut the notes in the solid aluminum keys. It was quite complicated, but it came together and we had a feast. Shall I let the techies go? No. We might not have a video. Okay, moving on. Fuck it. <laughs> it's a really cool video. <laughs> it was a video of the feast. Anyway, um, the table, like my book. Oh, wait, now we're way at the beginning. Holy fuck. Okay. The table. Oh, now it's playing. <laughs> but no sound. <laughs> anyway, I'll just keep talking. The table, like my book, is a rainbow. Because I had a vision years ago in which I saw, in completion, the book. Five years before I finished it. And it was a rainbow. In my vision, it looked exactly, hey, like that. <laughs> See how the pages are all different colors? That was possibly informed by a recipe I was testing from the hot pink chapter of the book. In the process of making the book, I felt a responsibility to test every recipe. Just to be sure, it tasted all right. Each color in the spectrum corresponds with a particular species. So I didn't need, that's the table of contents, I didn't need numbers. If you want to know where to read about sea star or long-spined sea urchin, you go by color. <laughs> well, the hot pink segment of the book corresponds to the psilocybin chapter. That's a recipe for psilocybin cochineal hot chocolate. Cochineal is an invasive insect that feeds on prickly pear cactus, in Mexico especially, my favorite. And um, it's a natural source of a hot pink or red dye. So the hot chocolate I was testing was hot pink. Psilocybin is an inv invasive species to Tasmania. For those of you who don't know what it is, 
Ask any scientist or any hippie sitting next to you, and I'm sure they can help you understand. Rest assured, we did not put any in the cocktails tonight, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> I won't say whether or not we served it at the feast. Now, here's another video. Let's see what happens. Ah! <laughs> Maybe now it's going to play. Well, I don't think it wants to play. It is a fact that cat consomme tastes exactly like pork broth, which for ethical reasons I would never touch. The pork broth, that is. In general, if you care about the environment and or animal welfare, the rule is feral cat is fine, Pork is a crime, unless it's barrel boar, in which case the more you eat, the more morally upstanding you are. That's boar. As you can see, there's a whole realm of ethics to explore in eating invasive species. But the basic idea is to approach how we source our food with intelligence. If there is an overabundance, we should treat it as a resource rather than as something to lament. And obviously, if ecologists and government agencies have decided that a particular species is so detrimental to the environment that their population must be culled, then I would suggest we have a moral obligation to do something other than leave their carcasses on the forest floor to rot, which is just a sad waste. <laughs> and not only is it a waste, it comes with an ecological cost, because all that dead meat on the ground causes a massive disruption to the ecosystem. Eating cat is a little sensational, but many of the species that eat the problem enjoy a celebrated status in our culinary history. Well, obviously boar. Um, venison, that's a dish by Tetsuya. Shannon Bennett doing rabbit. We are all comfortable with that. That's Vince Trim doing rabbit. Carp by Matt Stone. Feral Boar by Chef Balud. Ah, oh, Dave Moyle. <laughs> Our own local Dave Moyle. Love him. That's pheasant. What happened? I feel something strange has occurred. <laughs> something strange has taken place. Anyway. <clears throat> um, these are all familiar items on a menu. The deer problem is simple. We need only empower hunters to bring their kill to a licensed abattoir and create a system that supports them selling that meat to local restaurants and markets. This is currently illegal. So when we serve invasive venison at Mona, which we do all the time, <laughs> conscientious objection, it's cold from our property in Marion Bay, and we have to bend the rules, so to speak, by serving the venison for free and charging a shitload for the cocktails and everything else that you might like to accompany your free, ven your free venison. <laughs> um, I was just in Byron Bay, and this was not the problem. We did an eat the problem feast with Harvest, an amazing restaurant there. And they work with a hunter who's lobbied the government to get the licenses, and he was able to make selling invasive deer completely legal. So it's not that hard. In the meantime, I do believe we all ought to just do it. Of course, the head of <laughs> hospitality is sitting here. <laughs> but she's nodding her head. <laughs> um, in Queensland, thousands of deers are, deer are culled and left to decompose, all the while nearby residents happily die, dine on farm-raised cow, whose carbon footprint is through the roof. Between the energy spent growing cattle feed and the farting habits of the animals, 
shooting methane into the stratosphere and heating up the planet. Cow is a bad environmental choice. Not to mention the moral issues around farm-raised meat, which is really just an imprisonment of varying degrees of misery followed by a murderous death for our culinary pleasure. Oh my god, I sound like a PETA protester. <laughs> I think I need another drink. Maybe one with psilocybin in it this time. <laughs> now this one's really good. This is the test tube with mezcal, invasive mezcal, and invasive ants. It's really good. Let's have a toast. <laughs> Cheers. Mm. Delicious. Crunchy. Very crunchy. Lucky for us, <laughs> we escape that moral quandary. We don't need to get all heavy or all pita about it. We escape by eating fresh, delicious, cold, invasive meat, which takes no energy to generate and must die anyway if we are to preserve our native ecosystems. In fact, let's not dwell on the gore and let's just enjoy this beautiful book. That's that book. <laughs> let's look at it a little more. It's way better than David's book. I'm telling you, like, so much more fun. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. Anyway, um, eating the problem is really just elegant. It's applying intelligent design to a system where there is too much of one thing and too much energy going into another thing. We replace the old, inefficient model with a new, obvious, logical model. Of course, we do need the public buy-in, and that's why I chose the great chefs of the world to produce these recipes. Anything they cook is delicious and instantly desirable, or at least, at the very least, maybe not desirable, but credible, or maybe cool. <laughs> Science can also assist. For example, cane toad. One of the chefs in the book submitted a recipe for sweet and sour cane toad legs. Hey, wait, there it is. That's the one. Um, and of course, every dish had to be photographed. We spend ages styling the plates, positioning micro herbs, messing with tweezers, and I do version after version to make sure you get all the moods and feelings to get the flow of the book right. <clears throat> um, we were making plans to photograph this dish, and it turns out we don't have cane toads in Tasmania yet. If you all e keep eating cow, we will soon have cane toads in Tasmania as everything's moving south. That's the, that's the movement of invasive species as it heats up. So we got the toads shipped in from Queensland, but there was a slight miscommunication with the hunter. And he was supposed to cut off the legs, plop them in the mail, frozen, but instead, he um, sent them whole, and the poison from the um, paratoid gland seeped all over the body. And I'm thinking, OK, maybe we don't really want to eat those particular toads. Still, we needed the photo. So Chef Vince Trim cut the legs off, skinned them, soaked them in salt water, and cooked them up. And let me tell you, it took every bit of my willpower not to munch these things. Those juicy little legs, look at them. They smelled so good. And the thing is, they're really not that little. They are big compared to a frog's leg, which we eat all the time. Do you think, would you eat a frog's leg? Yeah, it's normal. So there's the puny little ugly frog's leg on the right, and the juicy, delicious cane toad leg on the left. I think that makes the point. However, to be fair, it's really more, really a more fair comparison with a buffalo wing because a cane toad leg is, um, I think it's a fair comparison. Big and, big and juicy. The problem is, <clears throat> although it sounds outlandish, I'm here to argue 
that the only thing standing between Australians and a few million good meals is science. There hasn't been enough science on eating cane toad legs and how safe this is or is not. I spoke to one scientist in Queensland whose opinion, opinion, not evidence-based, was that because the toxin is located in both the peri peritoid glands and at lower concentrations in the ovaries, um, one could encounter a situation where they consume a female's legs just prior to her ovulation. And um, if that were to happen, the poison could theoretically be traveling through the capillaries from the peritoid glands to the ovaries. Um, through the legs, doesn't sound very likely to me. <laughs> but we don't know if the toxin just stays in the ovaries or circulates through the entire system to get there. There are a lot of Queenslanders who, these, who eat these guys on a regular basis and swear by it but that scientist I spoke to thinks that they may be accumulating low-grade kidney damage. So it'd be really great to know because I assure you, if toad legs turn out to be okay, your culinary life will take a turn for the better. That brings me to a far more exciting problem for scientists to solve around toads than just eating them. Let's not forget smoking them. Smoking toad is a known and celebrated activity amongst elite circles of drug connoisseurs. Did you know that? You look so shocked. <laughs> really? <laughs> God, what circles do I run in? <laughs> anyway, here's an account. Let me read it. <clears throat> this is from a website called arrowid.com that has all the drug accounts you could ever imagine. And I quote, my friend smiled and asked if I knew of smoking toad venom and would I like to experience it. I accepted and filled my lungs with smoke, laid down and closed my eyes. Then, without warning, I had totally misplaced my body and physical reality and accepted my death as nothing but oneness with all. Bliss flowed calmly everything melting and whispering together, a complete feeling of home and very familiar. Then, voices and tones came from dark, drippy caves with feelings of sacrifice, the serious and dark beings of ancients and their knowledge. They handed me a knife and made me watch myself do it. This all scared the living shit out of me so much that it shocked me back into my body and left me trembling for another half hour, pondering this immense metaphor. They let me know that all may disappear if I am not here to witness it. Pain, happiness, feelings, people, love, all gone without you. I was on the road searching for answers, and these entities made sure I understood. They offered me the knowledge of the toad. People claim that the Australian toad will do that to you. And they believe it to be, they believe it to the extent that the Australian government made possessing a cane toad illegal. Now, depending on how you define possessing, um, if you live in Queensland and own a backyard, it may be difficult not to break the law. <laughs> in researching Eat the Problem, I spent three months entirely obsessed with this topic, the alleged drug qualities of the Australian cane toad. And let me tell you, I think I laid to rest once and for all the mystery as to whether Australian cane toad venom is a fun drug or not. I achieved this mainly through anthropological accounts and personal research, meaning research into people who personally smoke the toad. <laughs> I, it would be great if science could settle for certain what I believe I have confirmed by wading through a myriad of co conflicting empirical accounts. But basically, the Australian cane toad is not fun. It contains no DMT and lots of cardiac arrest compounds. 
Unfortunately, we imported the wrong toad. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> no, it really is a bummer when you think about it. <laughs> anyway, if you want the fun toad, you have to go to Mexico. That's where all the fun is had. <laughs> now, <clears throat> before I finish, I need to address the white elephant in the room. <laughs> Every second comment I receive on Instagram about Eat the Problem or at the end of any article says something like, I quote, I think we should eat the artist and the author instead. <laughs> Ooh. Or what about people? They're the worst invaders. Maybe we should eat them. And um, yeah, well, obviously, you know, why do you think the human chapter is the biggest in my book? <laughs> Basically, every single artist wanted to do human. Figuring out what color to make the human chapter was a political quagmire, but I sidestepped that one by essentially transitioning from pale peach to black in one single chapter. That would no normally prove quite problematic, but since just about every artist wanted to do human, it was easy. We have endless artworks on human. We even have a submission for invasive camel toe. <laughs> Though I wasn't sure whether to put that in camel or human. <laughs> there are several recipes for preparing humans. From the playfully conceptual to the entirely absur absurd, to the utterly practical. Actual recipes for preparing human taking, taken from the archives of anthropological accounts by early explorers. My favorite quote, in fact, <clears throat> is from this chapter from a member of a tribe in South America who ate their dead. He says, I think, and I think this is a nice place to end. He says, I'd rather be in a warm friend than by myself in the cold earth. The end. <laughs>